Hey, thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Absolutely, absolutely. I really wanted to have you on to introduce you to everybody real quick. Touring News here. He has a Twitch channel that I hang out in late night. And sometimes during the day, we do, you've been doing a lot of studying on macroeconomics. What was the video we were watching the other day um, when I was last in there? The gentleman who uh, was like into cryptocurrency, hmm. we were watching his videos. Was like yeah, of- I'm not exactly sure. Um, I can give like a little quick, like who I am to people, and then we can yeah. kind of get into the meat of things if you like. Let's do it. Wonderful. Well, yeah, thank you for having me on. Hello, uh, viewers. Uh, I appreciate, you know, you sharing some of your space today. My name is Brad or Touring News. Uh, to be very quick about it, I started uh, broadcasting and streaming. Actually, it's exactly two years ago today. I started oh, wow. on February February 18th of 2019. Uh, I started with the attempt of wanting to do like some type of live broadcast journalism with uh, fact checkers in real time being the Twitch chatters to kind of get to get to a position where you can't exactly mislead or misinform because you're kind of always like being fact checked in real time. So the channel kind of like evolved throughout time from covering domestic politics to international affairs to geopolitics to macroeconomics to monetary systems to now like cryptocurrencies DeFi, and so forth and i I really just like to look at uh, the big picture of energy inputs geopolitical trade uh, tensions currencies debts private sovereign and all of this kind of stuff and um yeah and now it got me to kind of where i am and actually currently what's happening on my channel is um i just started giving producer keys away to about like eight or twelve other people uh, so they're going to be doing different news broadcasts and deep dives on the channel that is touring news. And I'm kind of like stepping away a little bit. Uh, so last night we had somebody covering the Haitian and uh, Myanmar protests. And now we have other people that are going to be doing like specialized uh, schedule events about like eight to 15 times a week. And we're kind of moving towards that route. Oh my God, that's really cool. I didn't know you guys were getting into that. So is is it going to be more of like uh, multiple people on throughout the day? Are you going to try and have the channel on like 24-7 or... Uh, it's not going to be 24-7, but we are building a schedule. We're building a matrix in the Discord and everything. So there's like uh, there's about nine time slots that are booked right now. Uh, some are going to be on like Chinese geopolitics. Some are going to be on the Global South. There's going to be one or two tech shows. There will be like one or two econ shows. And it's all going to be like scheduled and so forth. And the reason that it kind of works is my Twitch channel is unaffiliated. So you can't subscribe and you can't donate bits. I've been like out of the affiliate agreement for a very, very long time. Uh, so anybody can go on my channel and monetize like in their own way, uh, you know, drive like content back to their streams or drive revenue back to their streams or so forth. So it's kind of like a nice ability to we can broadcast on Facebook. We can broadcast on DLive, on uh, Periscope, on LinkedIn, on Theta and all these different places. I like it. I like it. So you're really trying to and I've heard, I, I like the idea of like trying to build like a network around it and bring in other people to fill in space because you can't be live all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was uh, starting to wear on me covering like daily geopolitical Middle Eastern conflicts. Um, I was in I was in Israel. I was in Jerusalem actually on the day that the United States moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, that was like my first time trying to do like uh, foreign or international uh, coverage or so forth. But just staring into like the the war in Yemen or the conflict in Syria or Ethiopia or so forth. If you you know it's like Nietzsche says, if you stare into the void, the void will become you or whatever. Uh, So I kind of had to like step back a little bit and empower some other people to do kind of like the broadcasting. So Brad, a little bit more on your background. Where are you from? Like originally, where'd you grow up and stuff like that? Uh, Mount Carmel, Pennsylvania. I'm about like five minutes away from the town that's on fire. Centralia, Pennsylvania. There was uh, a coal fire that started underneath the town in the 1980s and it kind of like spread out. So the entire town had to move away. Um, I went to Penn State University to study environmental resource management with a specialty in renewable resources. And then uh, I kind of like had an interesting 20s to get to where I got to now. So you're like in your 30s or so? You have to be your I am 31, yeah. 31? Yep, 31. Okay. okay, I'm 35. All right, okay. And then you started the channel, so what, 29 or so? <clears throat> and you... Yeah, yep, it, yep. And so I've only caught your channel when you've been streaming. Have you had other people on it currently, like recently? Last night was the first time that we did like a a show. Um, A friend of mine came on to cover. uh, He did about two hours on the Haitian and Myanmar protests. And tonight somebody is going to be at 7 p.m. doing all things electrical grid, uh, energy systems, nuclear renewables and so forth. So that's going to be from like 7 to 9 Eastern tonight. Uh, and then, like I said, there's going to be, there's more and more people kind of joining into the schedule. Eventually, I think we'd like to get it to maybe 40 or 50 hours of planned content per week. 
and then I'll be able to come back and do some of my like economic coverage or economic analysis or so forth. That's really cool, man. I really like what you're building. This sounds awesome. Oh, thank you. And it seems like it's happened so quickly in two years. That's amazing growth that you've had. And <laughs> um, I mean, even when I click over and watch your channel, I love like how in depth you're going and it's on topics that I'm like interested in, you know, so I love just kind of lurking because I don't know as much about it um hopefully and that's why we're having you on to kind of talk about some of this stuff so i love to just lurk and listen um whenever i can catch it you know yeah i just um i have like a, a deep curiosity uh, i've streamed for maybe three thousand five hundred hours uh in those two years and it's usually just about like bringing up like a 20 or 30 page paper or bringing up like an hour-long video and trying to go through kind of like deep dives and deep analysis i really started getting into macro econ after reading some of mark Blight's work and uh, watching one of his 2019 videos talking about um, United States consumption, U.S. GDP, services sector, gig economy, and all this stuff. And it started to open my mind into looking at kind of like the, the bigger picture items. Right, right. Like what is currency and all that stuff. And then you get led down the road of cryptocurrency and things like that. Right, yeah. Yeah, so anywhere that you like want to begin or so forth, you know, I'm kind of happy to like discuss whatever it is that you, you I you mean, wish. what about like, so I kind of, I'm interested in like M1 money supply and things like that. Are we devaluing the dollar, do you believe, you know, and is that what, is that what kind of led you into the cryptocurrency rabbit hole or, you know, what, because that stuff I've never studied. So just kind of what, what you yeah, think is um, happening from COVID, you know? Yeah, I think, um, well, I, I think that it was happening prior to COVID. Um, where do I want to begin with this one? So I, a lot of people have maybe seen that one chart of uh, wages against productivity from the 1970s moving forward. Uh, they kind of show how, you know, productivity went up. It was like 250% or something, but wages mostly like stayed the way that it was. So I started just looking into what happened to the United States dollar post uh, decoupling from gold in 1971, when kind of like the the end of Bretton Woods as it was uh, took place. Uh, for people that know the story or don't know the story, the French sent over a ship uh, with, a bunch of, with a bunch of dollars and they wanted to redeem the dollars for gold. This was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back of the US was unable to pay their obligations at $35 an ounce anymore. So this was where Richard Nixon depegged the dollar from $35 would get you one ounce of gold to being free floating. And then in the 1970s, you had gold skyrocket all the way up to I think it went from like $35 an ounce to maybe like $600 an ounce at one point. So I've been trying to understand like what is fiat money? How how do we create the money right now? And I'm interested in like what the shift into central bank digital currencies is going to be, how it's functionally going to operate, what's going to be happening with treasury bills and uh, and this kind of stuff. So that's Okay, let's definitely start there. So what is money currently and how do we create it? Okay. Um, to me, there are a couple different ways that money would be, quote, created. I There are three different types of banking theories that most people probably subscribe to. There's the intermediary theory of banking, which would just be uh, the, the bank simply acts as a pass-through. There's no – they don't really provide anything except they just, like, they find buyers and they find sellers and they put them together. Uh, there's the credit creation theory of banking, which uh, touches into they loan out of their reserves. and Did I say fractional reserve? Sorry, I meant to say fractional reserve theory of banking, where you loan out of your reserves and you kind of have to keep X amount there. And this is where you hear some people talk about the money multiplier effect uh, and on and on. Then there is the credit creation theory of banking, which has been pushed forward by Richard Werner in a paper that he wrote. And then a couple other papers that people have said that the, the banks do not create their loans. Uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with their reserves. They, If I go to a bank and I want to get a business loan, they create the currency mostly out of thin air. There, there are some kind of regulatory aspects of reserves and so forth. However, as your community probably knows, and as some people would know, I think it was March 25th, 2020, the United States government said the reserve requirement ratio for banks is now reduced to zero. So I've been trying to understand what exactly that means. Um, to, to keep staying on like point of your question, my answers are going to take a long time, so I appreciate you giving me the time to speak. No, this um, is good in-depth information. So to me, the, the private banking system has a much easier ability to create credit. And when they create credit, they're, they're creating money or they would be creating you know, money supply. Um, a problem that seems to be that we can touch on in a little bit would be like the euro dollar or kind of like the international shadow banking system. So that'll be, I think that's like a big good thing to dive into. 
Um, as far as how the United States government creates money, you've heard some people talk about MMT and the government can never default on you know their debts or so forth. And I think that there's, I think that MMT is a useful lens of maybe kind of like some analysis and so forth. What is MMT? But ever, uh, modern monetary theory. The the very simple uh, definition of modern monetary theory would mostly just be. Okay. As long as you control the printing presses of the debts that you owe to different nations, you can never default on them. So to give some examples, the United States can never default on dollar denominated <laughs> debts because they would just be able to create more dollars is kind of like the theory of it. Mm -hmm. um, now to Pennsylvania. That sounds would... really selfish and risky in itself. Like that sounds like really Ponzi schemishly scammy. Like I would yeah. never, I would never want to lend anybody money if they said that to me. They were like, "Yeah, well, we got the we got the printing press, so we can never default. I'll just print more." Like, okay, well, this doesn't yeah, sound like a great loan. It's not exactly great, but it is more or less how it works at the moment. the The little caveat that I do want to throw in is I've really been trying to study who are the buyers for Treasury bills at the moment. So, when the government wants to create a dollar. They create a dollar into the economy, but they have to sell one dollar of treasury bills to what are called the 24 primary dealers. There's 24 primary dealers that have special arrangements with the United States government where they have to purchase the issued treasury uh, bills, and then they sell them into the secondary market. And I think the reason why the government has this, uh, this like arrangement with them is because it would be too difficult for them to have one agency to sell treasuries to the entire global system. Mm -hmm. So they kind of have to have these 24 prime dealers, which are kind of like warehouses and brokers that then sell the treasuries out into the international community. Are those now, what the was big happening... banks that make the Fed? Because the Fed is like a group of banks that we don't know, right? No, those are the 12 uh, banks that make up the Fed. The primary dealers are going to be your Goldman, your JP Morgan, BOA, okay. um, though they're going to be these these big entities that have a special relationship with the fed and with the federal government in order to warehouse the treasuries until they get sold into the other markets okay so there was a, there's a, a hmm, i'm going to try to keep this all coherent there's a dilemma called triffin's dilemma uh triffin wrote about this in like 1960s or something and it it mostly said that if you are the global reserve currency and you're a fiat currency you more or less have to run trade deficits with the international community because the international community needs dollars or needs that reserve currency in order to fund uh, the system. So when we got into the deal with the OPEC uh, nations, when we said, you'll sell all your barrels of oil in dollars, we'll, we'll back it up, we'll give you, we'll give you defenses, you know, we'll kind of secure everything. This was a little bit of the beginning of the petrodollar in like 1974. Mm -hmm. And if you look at charts of the United States trade imbalances, from about 1975 onward, we've just grown larger and larger and larger trade deficits. And this mostly happens because the international community requires a lot of dollars in order for them to buy resources and minerals and uh, oil and so forth. So you've kind of got this dilemma where in order to keep the global financial system running, the United States continuously has to run larger and larger deficits because the overall global demand for those dollars remains very high because right. so many goods are priced in those. So from the from 75 until maybe like 08 09 if we want to like get to like QE yeah. what would happen for the United States would be I would buy a German car uh then the then BMW would send the dollars to a German private bank the German private bank would send them to a German federal bank the German federal bank might eventually exchange them for United States treasuries so the best thing that could have been happening was we would send our little paper you know chits out to a foreign country and then they would buy our, our long-term debt. Yes, that makes complete sense. And that was very good because it was circulating our little units of, you know, denomination or debt holdings or credit. Or it was it was circulating our Federal Reserve notes. It seems to be that specifically from 2014 moving forward, global central banks have not added to their net treasury positions in the same speed that they were doing before and or certain sovereigns are not holding as much as they were. So if you look at the Federal Reserve balance sheet from 09 until now, and specifically from COVID-19 until now, everybody has seen all of the parabolic upticks in treasury positions or mortgage-backed security positions. So even at the moment right now, 
the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States is buying $80 billion worth of treasuries per moment, which is uh, what Tree MTCDX said. The government is buying it. So right now and since for the past 14 months, there hasn't been enough global demand for the treasuries, which means instead of the primary dealers selling them to the secondary market, the primary dealers are selling them directly back to the Federal Reserve Bank. And if you look at the United States Treasury on the 10 year or on the 30 year, this in my like opinion, a huge problem. Yes. Uh, in my <laughs> opinion, you, you see the yield on the 30 year going up. I think it in the past six months, it went from about 1.5 to 1.56 up to about 2.06. So to me, that coupled with a little bit of downward pressure on the dollar is kind of going to show that hmm, how exactly do I want to say this? Um, Normally, when a currency of a nation depreciates in value, it's overall good for that nation's economy because then your exports are going to be more attractive for the global market. Um, so the, the dollar is trying to devalue against the Dixie or certain other baskets of currencies out there. And that kind of needs to happen. That way, our goods, products, and services become more affordable for kind of like the global, the global markets. However... The, the problem is we don't manufacture anything. Um, it's about, I think we have 55 million workers in the United States working in the gig economy, and that data comes from 2019. Um, two thirds of our economy comes from consumer spending. We've got 47% of the people working in the services sector. So we don't really, we don't produce goods. We don't produce really anything. So our currency devaluing is going to end up hurting because it would be increased energy prices, increased imports, um, and like we don't really have anything to export at the moment. So normally, if you're a non-reserve currency, that kind of works out in your favor where you can like rebalance the scales a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. is kind of different in, uh, in that sense. We've given up on like manufacturing things here. Um, partly that we've given up, partly, uh, I mean, capital flew to markets that had cheaper labor and less environmental regulations. Right. So from, you know, kind of like the opening up of China, Indonesia, India, and other manufacturing regions, uh, this was kind of just the natural flow of funds of capital to go find the cheapest uh, region that it could, you know, make profit from. So what happens now if our government has to buy our own treasury bonds and foreign countries and, you know, foreign entities aren't buying, scooping them up, then, like, yeah. the circle is broken at that point. I, like, is that what's causing the yields to go up to entice foreign governments to then want to buy them again? Um, in uh, Again, everybody, these are just my opinions, you know, so please fact check me on as much as you can. Um, in my opinion the yield rising is evidence that it needs to rise in order for the demand to be met. So the demand doesn't have to just be uh, foreign central banks. It could be a foreign pension. It could be a foreign investor. It could be a foreign company or so forth. Mm -hmm. But yes, if you're not having enough of a bid at 1.56 and you're not having enough of a bid at 1.75 and then you're not getting enough of a bid at 2.06, to me, in my mind, it makes sense that that yield would need to continue to rise because people don't feel that it's an adequate uh, deployment of their capital or risk to take on at the moment. So it, it seems that that will, that will continue to rise until that right amount of uh, buyer will be found or met. And this is kind of like some of the beginning of them implementing what you're going to hear people talking about yield curve control. So yield curve control would be the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States stating that we are not going to, to allow the 10 year to get above this point, And we're not going to allow the 30 year to get above this point. So in my view, in order for them to do that, they would have to not only take their $80 billion of treasury purchases that they're doing at the moment right now, but potentially have to even raise that a little bit if the yields are still trying to, you know, kind of burst through that ceiling. So you're going to see, hmm, and you actually asked the question, is that a problem? It is a problem. However, the ECB is doing it. The Bank of Japan is doing it. The BOE is doing it. The People's Bank of China is doing it. So any... Mm, any nation that has large enough military monetary sovereignty or power is monetizing their debts at the moment right now in order to deficit spend to try to either kickstart economies, jumpstart green economic developments, or redevelop like um, modern 21st century uh, infrastructure and architecture. So since all of the central banks around the world are doing it, I don't exactly know how that will completely play out. 
And so do you see this becoming like an issue um, with I like what led you down the road of cryptocurrency then from all of this? Like you obviously okay. see this becoming an issue or no? Yeah, I um, well, I started, like I said, I was staring at like Triffin's Dilemma, Monetary Flows, Euro Dollars and re remind, remind me to come back to the Euro Dollars at one point. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, I just um, I started getting concerned about like what was going on with currencies. And then I read a really great book called The Changing World Order by Ray Dalio. Uh, he took uh, his team from Bridgewater Associates. Bridgewater is, I'm sure some of these people know, a really big hedge fund. Probably, mm -hmm. I don't know, how many billions under management? I know he's worth like 18 billion or something. Um, yeah. But he, he built a big research team. And he tried to look through uh, the rise and fall of different global powers on a 500-year time scale to see what happened with their education, their military, their monetary systems, like the trading powers and all this kind of stuff. And it kind of feels to me that we're shifting into a multipolar currency world, which would mean that sometimes trade is going to be settled in euros. Sometimes it might be settled in yen. Sometimes it might be in yuan. Sometimes it might be in gold. Sometimes it might be in dollars. But it seems that there is a shift away from being so dollar-centric to being more multivaried uh, you can you can kind of look at the um, the Asian trade block that they've recently developed, and I'm kind of curious to see you know is there going to be you know a regional trading currency there? The euro seems to be gaining a little bit of like power and uh, trading. Uh, Russia and China are now trading back and forth in the euro. I think China and Iran are trading in yen. I know China did a currency swap with South Korea. They did a currency swap with Brazil. They did a currency swap with Argentina. They're rolling out the digital yuan, and I think that this is a a slow slow transition to be being using things these as like global payment systems or global uh, settlement systems so i started then looking into what are central bank digital currencies what does it mean to have a fed wallet is this going to change the way we sell treasuries and then from cbdc's i got into some papers then i started looking at bitcoin being is it a currency is it a digital gold is it a storeholder value is it a speculative asset and after i understood kind of like Okay, they're trying to become, you know, a currency. Then I shifted my focus into being interested in DeFi, in smart contracts, in oracles, in getting off-chain data onto the chain, in ending the T plus two stock trading system that you know everybody spoke about with the DTCC and the FSC and these kind of things. So I am interested in tokenization of current assets that can then actually not be, I guess, like overshorted or oversold. Um, there was just an article somewhere that at one point there was $349 million more of GameShop share sold than existed at a, a specific point. Yeah, it was like 140% of the shares were sold short. R right, right. Um, huh. And yeah, the, um, the, the book, The Changing World Order, it was really well done. It was really well researched. It, it had a lot of charts. It had a lot of deep, complex data. It went through U.S.-China relations, the global development of the dollar, and so forth. So that was um, – I'm going to stop here and let you re-ask a question and recenter. No, I really liked I, – I liked where we were going there, you know, and, like, where you're going with crypto. So do you think Bitcoin, I guess, has a place in that multi-currency world you see coming, you know what I mean, with transactions? Yeah. Um, hmm, how do I want to answer some of these things? I value – or I look at Bitcoin against gold. So I I have tried to evaluate like what flow of funds can still be like moving into Bitcoin. So I've kind of thought that it's going to be moderately easy for Bitcoin to get to around like a 1.8 or a $2 trillion market cap, because that's still going to be one fifth of the global uh, wealth that's stored within uh, gold at the moment. So the gold market is around like 10 to 10.6 trillion. But then, I mean, there's a lot of paper gold written out there. There's a lot of derivatives on it and so forth. So, I mean, you can talk to I, – I spoke to Jan Neuenhoy, who worked for Voima Gold and does his own research project. And he was trying to look into the different manipulations that have been done from the, from the central banking system on, like, de depressing uh, the actual value of gold. So I, I think that there is definite room for, you know, this growth within the Bitcoin space. Um, there's going to be further commercial adoption. You know, it might be Alphabet, it might be Al Amazon, it might be Facebook. But I do imagine that you're going to see more commercial uh, publicly traded entities uh, holding some of their, you know, cash uh, assets within Bitcoin or within some other uh, crypto digital storehold of value. There are some central banks maybe beginning to explore with it. I think Switzerland maybe has a little bit. I know Iran was passing some legislation that uh, the, 
the traditional citizenry is no longer allowed to mine Bitcoin. I think all of the Bitcoin mines in Iran have been mostly taken by the state. And now they're trying to build up, I think, what is, um, you know, their internal, you know, potential pool of coin. Because, I mean, Iran has been sanctioned by the United States uh, basically to hell. They can't they can't sell into any kind of market. Mm. So there's so definitely kind of go ahead, go ahead. Does this like then just going through all this as you spout as you say all this, does this devalue the dollar further and give us a need then to have to do something other than providing you know, a safe currency for the world. You know what I mean? Like as we, as we, I feel like as we, uh, stop as the world's reserve currency, you know, then we have to find something else and bring back manufacturing or other services to then, to supplement that loss. Because I feel like from where we started from the beginning of this conversation, the major part of our economy is being that world safety reserve. And it sounds like that's going away. Um, well, to be like, well, I'm streaming in a dark room, so to kind of give a dark answer, uh, it's difficult <laughs> to bring jobs. It's difficult to bring a lot of jobs back because like, you're going to have to rebuild a manufacturing base. You're going to have to rebuild a factory. You're going to have to pay healthcare. You're going to have to pay like a 20 to $25 wage. Whereas a lot of these goods and services that are being produced internationally are maybe on like a dollar an hour wage and maybe, you know, not as much. So the... Mm -hmm. The numbers and cents don't exactly add up at the moment to reshore or onshore a lot of jobs back. I think Japan, at the beginning of COVID-19, spent around a billion dollars to bring some industries back from China to uh, Japan. And I think they brought a few out of India back to Japan as well. But there would have to be a large uh, either discount on repatriation of offshore funds domestically, giving a big tax break that way or probably have to subsidize uh, like a corporate redevelopment back into domestic. So it's... What are your thoughts I, on tariffs? Or they like don't work. Um, they don't... They, I, I mean, they're... I, I think the tariffs are one of the first like steps of war. Uh, <laughs> in Dalio's book, you know, it actually goes through where like wars don't begin with bullets. Wars begin with IP. Wars begin with tariffs. Wars begin with trade. Wars begin with the simmering and bubbling tensions and so forth. So, like, the whole tariffs that we tried to do on China, that ended up just making our, like, they were able to do what they wanted to do with their currency and kind of, like, hide the stuff within their books. So, in my opinion, we were the ones that ended up paying for most of the tariffs. Um, yeah, and, like, I don't, the I don't exactly think they were. Thing, like, the people on our end of the contracts, you know, buyers from America or sellers from America ended up paying the tariffs than the other end. But I feel like that's how it kind of should be, though. Like, so the point of the tariff, like, isn't the point of it is to stop places like China or other, th like, you know, third world countries. Yeah, I'm not saying China is a third world country or anything like that. But I'm just saying, like, other up and coming nations from doing things like slave labor to undercut labor costs or polluting to undercut pollution costs. Shouldn't we be taxing people? here that are bringing in goods to keep the prices because i feel like the problem is the american consumer just honestly doesn't give a fuck and that's the problem we have here is like they just want the cheapest good possible so we need to make sure that the cheapest good possible to them is the one that's at least made correctly right or and not using okay no, this, is, this is excellent there's a lot uh within this um first what i wanted to say is i think that that's a a noble a cause for like a reason to tariff. I don't think that that's exactly why they tried to implement them or the right. reasoning that they gave. I think that the reasoning that they gave was to try to rebalance the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. Now, do do I do I like where you're going with it where you're trying to develop better labor standards, develop better, you know, environmental standards or air standards? Yes, I do like that way. That's some of what they were trying to do with the US Mexico Canada trade agreement. Uh, however, I mean, there aren't really many like labor protections. There's not many union protections. There's not many like environmental protections to, right. to touch on. You really hit on like the biggest thing. The American consumer gorged on cheap debt and cheap access to goods and services from like the 1980s until now. And now that there is a beginning of decoupling, now that there's a little bit of nationalism, now that there's a little bit of deglobalization or a little bit of breaking down of supply chains and so forth there, the the cost of those goods would have to rise in order to adequately compensate either either domestic or international labor. 
And I don't really know how this decade is going to play out because, like, I think you're going to have deflation in some sectors, but then you're going to have inflation in others. I just went to buy ramen noodles the other day, and a paper pack of ramen noodles is 30 cents, which it definitely didn't used to be. Yeah. And the beans yeah. that I used to eat from Aldi, uh, the German grocery store, used to be 45 cents a can, and now they're 60 cents a can. So I look at um, healthcare costs, college costs. I look at equities as you know a potential inflation. Uh, we can like discuss that if people want to. Um, but housing costs and everything. So I see a lot of actual costs to everyday life uh, inflating. Yet they continue to say, "Oh, CPI is down. Like we can't find inflation and so forth." That so was going to be my next question. Work. That was going to be my next question. So how are they saying they can't find inflation when literally everything you just said—the cost of food is going up, lumber is going up, the cost of equities is like flying through the roof. At yeah. valuations that are getting pushed up, like it's not like these companies are having crazy record-breaking sales or anything. It's that we're paying more for for what they already did before. You know what I mean? And, and there's just so much free-floating money floating around. How how does all that? How does this play out in the future in your mind? Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah. Um, well, to to give like a historical lens of what's called like a reflation trade, I think this is going to like make sense as to what's happening. Um, yeah. So. I, I think it was like 1933 or 1934, maybe it was 34. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, put forward a decree that said you're no longer allowed to own gold anymore. We're going to we're going to confiscate the gold. We're going to buy all of it up and so forth. And the next day, the stock market actually went to the moon. So because you weren't allowed to store your your money in gold anymore and because people were like, OK, well, what's happening with these paper currencies and so forth? Everybody flooded into the equities market. So fast forward to 1971, when the United States uh, depegged the dollar from gold at $35 an ounce. Uh, Dalio, and this comes from the book, The Changing World Order, Dalio went into his trading desk thinking that the next day was going to be an absolute bloodbath. He thought that everything was going to be sold off. He thought everything was going to be red. He thought everybody was going to be liquidating. However, everybody was flooding into equities because they needed a hedge. They needed to get out of paper. They needed to get away from what they were thinking was going to be devaluing. So I think that you had the same thing happen in 2020, where we're still in this massive reflation trade, where because yields on bonds are so low, because you can't really get any return on savings, because everybody feels like inflation is taking place, because pensions are trying to get that. I've, I've actually read papers that the New York Pension Fund only stays solvent if they return 7 to 8% every single year, full stop. So if they have any kind of like bad year, they run into potential insolvencies with pensions. And this is only one. There's there's huge pension problems across the country. And there's a huge demographic problem across the country because all of these older people are going to have to be liquidating parts of their portfolios in order to pay for their long-term care or to pay for their downsizing and so forth. So Raul Paul, a, a big resource that I use a lot, Real Vision Finance. Yes. Uh, they give uh, they give a one, yeah, you know it. Um, yeah, oh yeah. Paul, yeah, they give, give, go ahead and give an, an, uh, a little short intro. Fair. They give um they give a thirty day one dollar trial if you like their content, but it's um it's a bunch of people who talk about global macro, cryptocurrencies, alternative assets, uh, different ways to make money and so forth. It's a really good channel focused on just investing and so forth. Um, but yeah, so he has a good video talking about this demographic problem. How like who are going to be the buyers for all of these homes when these people sell off their homes in the smaller towns that we don't want to live within. You know, what's going to happen to bond markets? What's going to happen to equities markets and so forth? So we're actually, that's going to be another really big thing to pay attention to throughout this uh, this decade. I, I agree with that. There's definitely, you can see a shift in the population happening and it got like heavily accelerated last year. Like I could say the last decade that I lived in Denver, Colorado for quite a few years, like five years, um, you know, between the end of the last decade and the start of, you know, the teens. And you could see people shifting and moving as the internet becomes more prevalent and, you know, work from anywhere becomes more prevalent. And then this past year with COVID, that's just been exacerbated where you see people flooding out of high price California, flooding out of New York, and they're going to places where they want to live. They're going to Denver. They're going to Las Vegas where there's no income tax. They're going to Wyoming where there's no income tax. They're going to Florida where there's no income tax. They're going to Austin, Texas, you know, and, and all the fun stuff that's happening down there in the tech world down there. And it's crazy to watch all that movement and kind of like, I don't know, there's definitely going to be a shift in real estate from some areas to others as some of these 
you know, a lot of America, when you look back at history, were built on like railroad lines. And then it was like on highways around World War II and transportation of goods and services and things like that. And as like trucks automate and, you know, look at a lot of the towns that were built around railroad lines, those have since died off with highways. And now you're seeing the same thing with highways, like all these cities that are on I-80, I-70, 75 and all this stuff, you know, they're going to, they're slowly dying off because we don't need as many stops anymore and you can you can live and work from anywhere and as this like trucking and thing gets automated it's going to really remove a lot of those smaller cities that really don't have as much of a purpose and i feel like concentrate our population um in like economic and like thought growth centers hopefully yeah um to put to put some data onto what you're putting out there i think it's like three hundred thousand people moved out of new york city i don't even know the numbers out of california um but for years i've not i've been I don't really worry about international capital flight. Um, I've worried about domestic capital flight, kind of um, what you're talking about. And to give a story that like illustrates what happened is uh, David Pepper was really one of the first people that kind of like began uh, this big move. I think it was in 2016. David Tepper was running Appaloosa Management, a uh, really huge hedge fund. He had he one year paid $140 million in state taxes to the state of New Jersey. $140 million in state taxes to one state. And he was like, well, you know what? Like, I live on the East Coast. I work in the hedge fund game. Miami is right there. I can get commercial real estate there. I can move my hedge fund down there. No state income taxes in Florida. Boom, I'm going to move down there. And New Jersey had to convene a special meeting to bring their budget committee together because they had to plug this $140 million hole just from one person moving out of the city. So now you have this happening in California. You've got this happening in New York. You've got it happening you know, in other places and so forth. The town that I'm in right now, our population peaked in the 1930s or 1940s at, at around 17,000 people. Now it's down to like 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. And there's just, there's nothing left. Uh, Pennsylvania is just scattered with a lot of these like abandoned towns. Man, that, yeah. And you see it here in Ohio too, like driving up to Northern Ohio. And I used to do work in Michigan and Detroit and you drive up to Detroit. It's like a wasteland up there, like literally going up 75. Some of the first things you see when you get into the Detroit area are like, 20 story office buildings that have like all the windows blown out and are completely abandoned and you're just like whoa and there are very few police on the road and there's potholes everywhere tons of abandoned buildings and stuff and it's like man this is a tough it's a tough project what do you think about like with all this going into some of the questions like peculio said thoughts on ubi is it possible to give a ubi is that even in the cards or is that just li are we lying to ourselves uh, well, it's possible it's going to be tried. Um, I don't exactly know how it's going to completely play out. I, I take some a disagreement that people call it universal basic income. I, um, if it was going to be universal, we should give it to every person on the earth. Not to put that to, you know, um, that's just <laughs> my whole kind of thing. Um, but yeah, do I, do I think like it's a possibility for somebody to bring it up and push it forward? Yeah, it kind of seems like it is because, um, so Mark Cuban, uh, one of the people that now I think has become a proponent of UBI. I think that the the ownership class is beginning to realize that if the consumers don't have enough money to buy our goods, well, then we can't sell them our goods. So the United States is kind of in this conundrum at the moment right now where now that the saving, if you look at the savings rates of the U.S. consumer, they're through the roof and at astronomical levels that they haven't been at forever. I think it's beautiful. I encourage people to save. Uh, however, that doesn't work when you're a services and consumption-based economy. So they need to somehow kickstart and re-jumpstart that, that consumption process happening once again. I would imagine if they were going to do something like this, they may try to like time lock it where like if you don't spend it within X amount of days, maybe it like goes away or something because like they really, I mean, it was even evident when Mnuchin was talking about it. He said like, when they were talking about doing the stimulus checks, he said, this is the fastest way that we can get money into the economy. He didn't say it's the fastest way to get money into people's budgets or balances or hands or anything. He said, you know, it's the fastest way to get money into the economy. So I think that they need the velocity to jump back up and they need funds to circulate once again. So I think they're going to have to continue to try to stimulate grow or try to stimulate consumption in some way are we just kicking the can down the road like 100 billion percent this is why i am taking this year i'm going woofing it's called we'll work on organic farms i'm going to learn learn how to work with soils and renewables and greenhouses i have about 0.3 percent of my money in the united states dollars 
99.7% of my money is in some type of crypto asset. And I'm trying to do everything I can to make enough money to buy land in the fall. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. That makes a lot of sense. And re- and what's funny about that when you say buy land and people should buy, like, I definitely agree, like, buy holding assets and, like, holding as little USD as possible, you know? You see this, like, push currently from the news to, like, try and say millennials don't want to own houses or shouldn't own houses and should rent. Or that younger kids don't want to own real estate. And I think that is like the craziest thing to me. Like who, I don't know. Owning real estate is one of the best assets you can have. Somebody always needs to live somewhere. The land is needed. You know what I mean? I, 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 you know, that you can buy high. I just don't know. I feel like they're pushing people away from assets. And like you're talking about like towards UBI and spending and not, not saving or not investing, which is really weird to me. I guess, because I feel like we want people to save and be protected for a rainy day. And we're out here, like our government is out here rewarding corporations and things that didn't save for a rainy day and weren't able to protect themselves when something happened, you know? Yeah. Mark Blythe makes the analogy about the economy in Sweden and the economy in the United States. The economy in the United States is a Ford Mustang GT 500 V8, 550 horsepower blown out. Works really, really great when it's firing on all cylinders, moving forward in a straight line. But if there's any kind of like bumps in the road or any kind of turns and so forth, doesn't exactly work out all that well. Sweden, not as much growth, not as much equity valuation, not as much like inflation and assets and so forth. More like a Volvo car, you know, going to be stable, going to be reliable, can handle an accident, can handle, you know, a bump or two. And it's just going to kind of continue to go forward. But yeah, I think that we're... We're running down the highway at 300 miles an hour without really any airbags. And um, you've asked like some questions about like, is this going to happen to fix it? Is that going to happen to fix it? It's so hard because when you, when you try to shift like one thing, uh, you're, you're changing four or five other things that you didn't really think were related, but they end up being related. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I understand that. And like, you can, it's hindsight. It's always 2020 with everything like that. So what cryptocurrencies Mm -hmm. do you hold to try and hedge against all? Yeah, I have, um, I have dot uh bitcoin eth cardano rose tron link and i might have like one or two other things like lurking around somewhere that's what's up that's what's up to you. uh what like exchange do you use to purchase uh i use binance and coinbase okay um, okay and are, are what i use what it, what it, i'm interested in what you've learned about like oracles and like dot and like i guess link is more of an oracle and things like that i haven't done too much studying into those and how they work and i'm like afraid are you afraid at any time like how some of are you looking at all of these like currencies equities into like a network you know that's where i get a little messed up with cryptocurrency like what okay. is a cryptocurrency what's an asset you know what is like an equity asset okay um how i'll give my opinion on this yeah, yeah I, I can give my opinion so to me bitcoin is a cryptocurrency bitcoin is trying to be digital gold it's trying to be a storeholder value it might even be trying to be a currency so any any things that are claiming they're going to be used for transactions or or used in order to like exchange goods and services to me i think that that is cryptocurrencies then i think that you have a different asset class of you know ethereum which would be like kind of like the smart contract layer or like that protocol layer so I, I try to differentiate that there is there are there are crypto assets. Some are currencies, some are smart contracts, some are oracles, some are other benefits that are going to be needed within like the blockchain systems and so forth. Mm-hmm. And so I don't really even use the word cryptocurrency unless I guess I would be specifically speaking about Bitcoin at this point. Okay, that makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense to me. Actually, I kind of like how you explain that. That's something that's definitely how I'll probably explain it in the future, to be honest. Um, so when you look at them, like, so you only look at Bitcoin as your hedge against, like, currency. Bitcoin is by far the smallest amount of anything that I own. I think I only have some because people gave it to me. Um, really? But I sold, I sold most of my, I well, okay, so I'm not on my channel, so I can be, you know, honest as to why I did this. I sold most of my Bitcoin at around, like, 45000 uh, because I need to take uh, riskier gambles this year, and I need to get more returns than I think Bitcoin can give. So let's say that um, let's say that we're going to get like another like 100% return on Bitcoin. That means that you're going to need another 900 billion dollars worth of funds to flow into it. Definitely, very, very possible. 100% possible. It can probably even happen by the end of this year. 
However, I am interested in getting involved in smaller projects with smaller market caps that have more of a risk that can go through uh, exponential growth periods uh, faster than I think Bitcoin would be able to at the moment. So I, yeah, Bitcoin is kind of not risky enough for me with the returns that I need to make this year. I understand that. I'm looking at ADA for the same reason, and I, I feel the same way about Bitcoin. It's so big at this point. It's really hard to see the returns, you know, from 50,000. And I can't even, it's not like I could go purchase a whole Bitcoin to even see, you know, the fractions of that return, you know. Mm -hmm. But I feel like you have to hold some of it just because it's so popular right now. Like, do, do you feel... I don't know. I guess what what where are you looking in altcoins right now for your returns and like what has attracted your eye? Um, yeah. Um, well, my my biggest positions are Chainlink, Cardano, and Rose. Mm -hmm. uh, Chainlink is my biggest by far. I think I my average like purchase of Link was maybe around like thirteen dollars or something. Mm -hmm. um so i'm mostly i'm able to take a lot of risk on things that i do because i'm up a uh, i'm up a decent amount so like my i think link can go down to i mean pretty much like yeah it could go down to 13 dollars before i lose a penny yeah. so i i'm kind of able to take um and and you know you got into cardano really really early so you know what it's like to be able to take some risks mm -hmm. um to go back to your question about like the oh get wrecked you bought link at 53 cents well hey i can give you my address if you want to send any this way <laughs> yeah um Congratulations, though, uh, the big drop knee. That's a, a wonderful purchase. Um, you asked a question about like oracles and like what I think about oracles. So I'm interested in moving to a world where let's say that I have a nine to five job and I go to my job and I like clock in with my my time card. I want that smart contract to start running. And then as soon as I clock out, I want the payment to go into my account. I don't want to have to wait for uh, the business. I don't want to have to wait for a check. I don't want to have to like I want to go to a world where we're getting as much off chain data onto the chain via oracles, get it onto DLT, get it into smart contracts as much or quickly as possible. And then that's where that's where I want our um, our method of engaging with one another to go. I, I'm mostly done with utilizing the trust mechanisms and the brand brand mechanisms from like JP Morgan, from Chase, from Wells and so forth. I wanna go to cryptography and like mathematically settled contracts that say like if X happens, then Y pays out, or if C happens, then F is going to take place. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Like just from my real estate side of things and like purchasing real estate and all the trouble you have to go through, like with a title agency and lawyer, like even if you're not getting a mortgage, like I've purchased property in cash. And to do that, you have to, you know, there's still a title agency involved and they got to check and pull title to make sure there's no liens on it and all that stuff. And that's one of the biggest things. Like I reached out to Tezos at one point because I want to know like who will digitize my rental property. Like I kind of want to be a part of that. Like I have a rental property that could be digitized. The monthly payment could be digitized and paid out to investors. You know what I mean? And that's something that could grow. And if I could digitize it to buy more rental property and grow a portfolio, it seems really interesting to me, but I never, you know, obviously never get an answer back and my portfolio is probably too small. They're like, yeah, you're one, you're, you're two, your two properties, you know, are not, are not enough. You know what I mean? But that's what I'm interested in. And I definitely see a lot of like the extra spending that goes on when paying a title company and all that and how it could be so much faster and cheaper to cut all that out and have an immutable record of who owns what and what liens are placed where and you know easier transfer of title i think in real estate is a huge a huge place where that you know there there's uh room to grow you know what i mean a lot of hands a lot of yeah. hands in the pot when real estate so hands. the global global derivatives market is like one or two quadrillion uh global equities market is like 89.5 trillion i don't know sorry the global bond market i should sorry um, global gold market is like 10.6 trillion. Global cryptocurrency market is like 1.4, 1.5 trillion. Mm -hmm. Global DeFi market is around like 35 to 50 billion. So I'm wondering, is there going to be a shift in, um, uh, what do I call it, pensions? Is there going to be a shift in commercial investments where you're going to have certain funds say, okay, I'm going to put like, one even if they put like a tenth of a percent or a percent of their funds into crypto assets or cryptocurrencies or DeFi or so forth i try to evaluate some of these sectors as uh, like we were talking about the flow of funds how much potential fund flow 
is there to get from instant uh, that's the word i was looking for from institutional investment into DeFi, into crypto into these things so i'm hoping now this would just be like my dream world i'm hoping eventually people realize why should i be owning an equity that's 40 to 1 or 50 to 1 pe ratio never turning a profit never going to turn a profit why wouldn't i want to get into a token that i can stake a token that i can use like with the you know with the link um i can i can stake those and let people use the oracles and let them use like their actual function case so the crypto assets or the digital tokens that i'm interested in becoming a part of are ones that i think have a beneficial use case and a case that i can actually be like a part of i want to be a part of like the decentralized finance layer of being able to stake some of my holdings and be able to provide like a benefit or a utilization to other people that want to engage with that smart contract or want to engage with that Oracle or with that processing system. Understood. And like DeFi, like, are you talking about like banking changeover and stuff? Like what are some of your favorite DeFi coins? And when do you include like staking of link as decentralized finance, like staking of ADA as decentralized finance? And then I feel like other people also lump that in with like, there are crazy trading DeFi coins out there. So how do you like? Yeah, I don't really, I don't really talk about the whole loan aspect where you know you can like stake and then like take a loan out or so forth. But but with what you're talking about of like you know staking ADA or staking Link to allow other people, yeah, I would say that that is a part of DeFi. Okay. Anything that you can do where to me to me DeFi is there are going to be transactions taking place without a central authority more or less would be like a, a very simple way to put DeFi. So if there is an ability for two people to engage in a trade without having to rely on Robinhood or the DTCC or JP Morgan or like any of these entities, and you're just relying on the cryptography and um, the, I guess, like security of that, uh, that token that you were engaging with, that that I like moving towards. I, I'm not a very big, uh, big fan of like the, the banking system as it would currently be stated. And so what would all this do to the American dollar and like, you know, the Federal Reserve and stuff? Do you see a pretty bleak future or is there a way that they can incorporate all of this with, you know, central bank currencies or, you know, what do you see with the future on just, you know, your opinion? Yeah, um, well, this is I'm going to have to look for a paper here. Uh, there's a good paper that just came out that I bookmark it. Show all bookmarks. How how messy are your bookmarks on your back end? Because oh. mine get. They're awful. <laughs> okay. So I just found this paper recently. I'm going to link this through. One of your viewers is saying, listen up the top button. It's kind of my shtick. Um, I've always kind of kept it, you know, done. And like, this is my thing. I have like business in the front and then fighting in the back. I do have like very, very long hair. Um, but this is kind of like my thing. So I appreciate the fashion tip. Thank you. Um, <laughs> how, how do I see kind of like this playing out? Well, Gary Gensler taught um, blockchain and money at the MIT Sloan School of Business in 2018. And it's an open courseware that I'm trying to- That's what we were watching. That's what we were watching the other day. That okay. was such a good presentation we were watching. Yeah, so to anybody out there, there's an MIT open courseware, 24 or 25 different courses, 2018, Blockchain and Money, Gary Gensler. And he's about to become the chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States. So I'm wanting to get into his mindset to see like where our government is going to be going. Uh, the paper that I just linked in is called Decentralized Finance on Blockchain and Smart Contract-Based Financial Markets from Fabian Schar, but it was published through the St. Louis Fed research arm. So this paper came out uh, February 5th of 2021. And I think it's another good one to to keep getting into like the, the mindset of where like the governments are going to be going. Um, I do think that they're moving towards central bank digital coins. I think that they're moving towards Fed wallets. It seems that they want this ability to be able to inject liquidity or stimulus on a whim. What I don't know is, are they still going to sell treasuries when they do this? I'm almost positive that they are going to track the, the digital current, the coins. So I don't think that it's going to be like a private uh, distributed ledger technology or anything. I think it's going to be able to, they'll be able to see all the transactions that are taking place on the network. So I would say within a few years, you're probably moving towards central bank digital coin in the United States. About your question of like, what does it mean for like the dollar and the Fed and all this kind of stuff? It's too hard to speculate because like, there's always the United States war machine at the back end of all this that like, isn't going to let the dollar go away, regardless of what happens. Um, so, you know, like, is there going to be conflict with India? Is there going to be conflict with China? Will there be like, you know, something going on with Iran or so forth? So it's really difficult to speculate. Mm, 
I'm going to pause there and let you recenter it again. I understand. Yeah. So, like, do you think then, as as cryptocurrencies come around and these multinational, I guess, like currencies, these like multi trade currencies that are happening, do you think this is going to like affect our trade and how currently our country makes money trading with other countries? Like, <clears throat> what, I don't. I guess what do you see as the future of what our country needs to do? You know. Yeah. Um, well, if it were, yeah, if it were me, uh, well, let's actually talk a little bit about the euro dollar system, uh, because we got about like 15 minutes left and then we're going to come back to that one. Yeah. So the way that I've, um, been taught the euro dollar system is from a person called, uh, oh shit, what's his name? Um, Jeffrey Snyder from Alhambra Investments. He runs a YouTube channel called Euro Dollar University. And basically what a euro dollar is, is, European banks or even Chinese banks or like other banks, they can write loans that are denominated in dollars and that need to be repaid in dollars. So Deutsche can write, you know, issue a loan that they need to get paid back in dollars. The One Belt, One Road initiative that China is doing, a lot of those loans need to be repaid in dollars and so forth. So a little bit of the problem that the global financial system has backed itself into is there is a massive, 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 massive more amount of debt denominated in dollars and there are actually dollars chasing those debts so there's in 2020 a lot of central banks around the world i think it was 19 of them had to open up a currency liquidity swap with the united states federal reserve bank because they didn't have enough dollars to basically run their day-to-day -day operations of securing resources minerals oil and so forth so this was uh turkey it was south korea i think japan had one like i said there was about 19. so you've got this global problem at the moment where there, there are too few dollars chasing debts that need to be repaid in dollars. And I don't know how that carousel is going to stop. I don't know where the merry-go-round goes or so forth. So what I would do if I were in charge of, you know, someone like these presses or so forth is I would probably say, okay, like we did the Marshall Plan, you know, back in the 20s, China's doing the One Belt, One Road and so forth. We, as the United States government, are going to fund like $5 trillion or $10 trillion worth of global investment into hospitals, roads, energy generation, and anything else that nations may need to develop their country and develop their systems. It's going to be a grant. I don't want the money back whatsoever. So I would try to buy my way back into the good faith of the global world by buying them off and by utilizing the fact that we can kind of like create the, the currency units uh, in order to try to do like what would be t termed like a a global Marshall plan of redeveloping infrastructure and economies to meet like the 21st century. It but kinda, with what you were, it kind of seems like, sorry, it kind of seems like China is doing that. Like where we have stopped doing that, China has stepped in and has started lending to other countries and kind of getting in their goodwill. You know what I mean? Where yeah. We have stopped. I mean, my opinion is I've read through a lot of the loans that China is giving to these countries. It's better than any loan that was ever given by the United States, the IMF or the world bank. Now that, this isn't me endorsing China. It's not me saying, you know, China is like a good, benevolent nation or so forth. But if you look at the terms and services and the interest that they're charging on the loans, the early, early loans that they wrote were gross and disgusting. They, they got a port in Sri Lanka. They had leveraged like a few other countries to say, like, if you can't pay, we're going to get your assets. But a lot of the loans that have been written probably like post like 2016, 2017 and forward have been cheap loans with low interest rates. Because like they need access into these markets in order to become, they need more markets to sell into. Um, so they're yeah they're doing what the United States kind of like used to do or could have done. Whereas like our our policy a long time ago might have been to like trade and build. In in my opinion, from the 70s and 50s and 60s, we kind of like did a little bit too much regime change, uh, and it's now coming back to roost. That makes a lot of sense. That's a great way to kind of wrap it up, actually. I really like that. That I mean, it makes a lot of sense, and you see it full circle from where we started and did a lot of that and how we've kind of given it off to China. So do you see – So, and you think we need to get back into that mindset of, you know, getting on the good graces of foreign countries and causing, causing economic use of the American dollar is what will help America to kind of grow its way out of this. Yeah. I yeah I would go that route um, because a lot of the other paths like uh, from our conversation you realize like how complex it is to try to resuscitate what is like a dying economy because I mean even let's just talk about U.S. infrastructure right. like we can't get rural broadband we have potholes <clears throat> everywhere 
like our our train system is but you know like we just we developed at a different time and like um the final like little story to like finish on as to like what potentially could be coming have you heard the story of what happened with the chicago parking meters no far away uh, yeah in in the book uh, the shock doctrine from naomi klein it uh, it opens talking about like what happened with the parking meters in uh, chicago so the the city of chicago was facing a budget shortfall and they couldn't figure out where to get money couldn't figure out where to get money so they basically did a mortgage backed security on parking meters <laughs> they took all the parking meters from across the city they packaged them into one securitized unit they estimated what the revenue was going to be for 75 years from the parking meters and they sold it off to the highest bidder so the bidding was like going on and so forth somebody can fact check me on this one i'm almost positive it ended up being the abu dhabi sovereign wealth fund that owns a 51 percent stake via a shell company through jp morgan who has like a 49 percent stake but there were some shenanigans and so forth that went on. But basically, the city of Chicago took any of the revenue that they were going to make from their parking meters and sold it off to a foreign investment for them to be able to hold. And now they're getting like the recurring revenue. So what did those people do? Well, now they charge you until 8 p.m. until instead of 6 p.m. Now they charge you on Sundays. Now, if you want to have a street fair in the city of Chicago, before you could just petition, petition the city and they would shut the meters off for that day, but now you have to pay the private company um, for the meters. So Pennsylvania tried to sell off the turnpike around the same time, right after the global financial crisis. Pennsylvania was looking at selling off parts of our turnpike. Um, you had JBS, a, a very big Brazil beef packing company, come in, and I think they bought like Smithfield, Cargill, and a couple other places. You have WH Holding Group, a subsidiary based out of Hong Kong, coming in and buying Pilgrim's Pride and other chicken processing you know, pieces and so forth. So a person who makes like the analogy, and I think Luke Groman of uh, from Forest from the Pines makes this analogy. The United States has been selling off all of the silver in order to fund their like kind of like short term liabilities and so forth. So we keep this happens in Vancouver with real estate being sold off to Russian and Chinese investment it happens in London with real estate being sold off to foreign investment. We keep selling anything that anything that's not bolted down. We just keep trying to sell because like we have all of these like financial obligations that we can't really meet at the moment. Um, and I, you know, I come from the camp of Noriel Rubini, you know, the decade of depression, decade of deglobalization, decade of degrowth and like shifting. You brought up automation. You brought up how trucking is changing. We talked about the gig worker economy. I mean, those 55 million gig workers, no pay time off, no benefits, no health care, no 401k, no matching. Now you have the whole work from home craze coming. Silicon Valley is looking to pay people that live in Arkansas different than a person that lives in Philadelphia. And sorry for comparing a state to a city. Um, but you already have the tech sector <laughs> looking at paying people based on their zip code rather than being paid on like the job that they're their doing. Merit, so, yeah. Yeah. So you've got there. There are so many things like out there shifting. And I think that it's all kind of like happening like at the moment and very quickly. And this as the way to wrap it up is why. I now mostly focus on macro econ, monetary systems, trade flows, uh, all of this kind of stuff. Man, that makes a lot of good sense. And this has been an eye-opening, another eye-opening interview. I'm so glad you came on. I'm so glad we connected. And I'm so glad everybody got to see this because I've been hanging out in the channel forever. And I'm glad we got to kind of spread this a little bit. Do you have any questions for me or anything before we go anything like that um i didn't really prepare any questions for you i was just trying to make sure that i had like good information that i could download out of my brain for you all um but i would you know some people are saying like well one person said bring him back um i would be happy to come and chat again sometime if you wanted to do something like this absolutely man i think this is a great update on the situation and like i can't learn and know everything i love to have like experts on in different fields and i'm trying to grow that just to like learn like everything you're talking about i genuinely am interested in everybody in the chat should check out the touring news on twitch you should definitely check this gentleman out here and any other places before we go that everybody should find you at twitter oh yeah thank you it's uh it's touring news one on twitter most of the stuff that i do on twitch as i said you know the channel is going through a um it's becoming more, more of like uh, okay uh, the the channel is called Touring News is because I intended to be a traveling journalist that was going through like Europe, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and so forth. Um, I was actually I don't know if you knew this about me. I was at the Capitol Hill on January sixth when they stormed the building. Oh and I was my like, God. Uh, I was like thirty or forty feet away from going inside myself. Um, I was live streaming. 
Uh, my mother was watching. I had like people, you know, giving me like safety updates and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, the channel was supposed to be like a traveling journalists uh, live stream broadcast. Uh, availability to do like uh, tourism interviews internationally, cover international stories and so forth. So now it's getting a little bit back to the roots of giving the stream keys away to other people so they can kind of do the touring aspect a little bit and cover more stories than I'm able to do. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, dude. That's great. I really like what you're doing there. I've always wanted, I was hoping at the end of COVID I could travel a little bit and start hitting like conventions and things like that, whether it be business conventions, finance conventions, or cryptocurrency or whatever you know cannabis conventions and things like that so i get i get the mindset man i'll definitely be tuning in it seems like chat was really digging it um yeah um yeah they seem to have enjoyed it i i just appreciate you know being able to come into a community to share some of this um you maybe mentioned this one word expert um be aware everybody i don't have an econ degree all that i do is um my subscriptions i read the financial times i read the wall street journal i read bloomberg I will give away my political leaning here. I read Jacobin. I read Catalyst. I read Al Jazeera, South China Morning Post, uh, Haaretz, um, but Reuters, AP. I, I like to read um, business newspapers because if people pay a lot of money for your newspaper, you're not going to lie to them. So Makes a lot of sense, man. I really appreciate the time on, and we will definitely have to do this again as things develop over the year. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much uh, for the chance, and I am easy to reach out, so I hope you have a great day and a great stream. You I'll uh, well. chat with you soon. You as well. Have a good one, brother. All right, see you. Yeah. Yo, are we on fire with the interviews? Are we on absolute fire with the interviews these days, Chad? I'm having a lot of fun with these. I'm having a lot of fun. You know what we got to do now? Oh, giveaway time. Giveaway time for everybody that stuck around. You know what's got to happen? Everybody that stuck around is a marbles game, baby. Thanks for having me, everyone. That was a lot of fun. Dude, touring news. That was great. We really do need to do that again. Mibs game for the 82 folks that had a great time during that. Let's go. 550 on America's card room. Let's go. You got to sign up for ACR to get your $5.50. I thought I said $5 before, too, but I was so hyped. We tacked on another 10%, all right? Let you get in a full tournament. There's 24 people registered. Man, my mind is blown from that. I can't wait to watch that back on the YouTube. So much information flew there that I'm going to need to watch that back to really soak all that in. You know what I mean? I can't wait to get that up on the YouTube and soak all that in.